Okay. Um, I'll start. It's all a bit strange talking into the void, but um, uh, there were definitely some numbers there. So hopefully, um, hopefully there's somebody there listening to us. I don't think I'd ever make a good radio DJ. Um, but uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our second online event. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, please take a moment to say hello in the chat on the right hand side. Hi, Samantha. Um, introduce yourselves. Oh, good. There are people there. What a relief. Um, so today we're going to be um, talking about the importance of collaboration, both in general and specifically during the design process. We'll be looking at some techniques uh, and exercises um, that you can use as part of collaborative design. Uh, and then we'll be talking about how we can collaborate um, even in these uh, weird times when we can't uh, even shake hands, we can still collaborate. So we'll be discussing that a little bit. Uh, we'll finish off with a, um, a bit of Q&A. Um, we should uh, be all wrapped up by 2.30. Uh, a couple of my colleagues are joining me today to um, uh, to present this along with me. So my name is Alison Rawlings. I'm one of the directors uh, at Bunnyfoot. I've um, got Bex. Uh, Rebecca Gill, uh, also one of the directors, and Amy Windsor-Brown, who's our, um, in charge of our London office and our, a lead consultant. Uh, so there'll, uh, there'll be the three of us um, uh, presenting different bits of this. So um, we've got a lot of people joining us today, which is brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, we had people sign up from over 90 companies today. There's a random sample here, not selected by me. Um, I think maybe just so they all fitted and looked nice together. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. So as we go through, just a quick um, tour around uh, how Big Marker works um, for you guys. So on the right hand side, it looks like everybody's found the chat, which is brilliant. Um, but also on the tab next to the chat, it says Q&A. Uh, we're uh, having a, a questions and answers at the end. So as we're going through, if the question occurs to you, um, just put it up there um, on the Q&A and upvote the questions that you like the look of. And we'll answer as many of those as possible um, at the end. Also, this is all about collaboration. Um, so please collaborate. Let me know that I'm not here alone. Uh, there's a couple of places during the presentation that we'll, um, we'll ask for your ideas and your input. Um, so if you could um, put those in the chat as well, where you're all saying hello, then I'll be able to see them um, and include them as we're going along. Uh, on that splash of um, logos, there were definitely some there that I recognize as being organizations that we've worked with um, over the years, but there are some that were certainly new to me. So uh, this is just a little bit about Bunnyfoot in case um, you don't know us yet. Uh, a quick summary. So um, Bunnyfoot is a user driven design consultancy. Uh, so we have um, about 40 people, um, specialists from various um, uh, areas of expertise. We've got uh, UX strategists and designers. We've got researchers, um, service designers. Um, we've got some recruiters as well who recruit for our research. Um, and we all work together um, to deliver a range of services, but all in pursuit of creating exceptional user experiences, always with um, an eye on achieving um, po uh, positive and profitable outcomes for our clients. So um, in a nutshell, that's what we do. We have three offices, um, theoretically, one in London, one in Sheffield and one in Oxford. Obviously at the moment, um, most of us, like me, sat at our kitchen table and like uh, you all are as well, I'm sure. So we're part of a larger group, um, sideshow group. Um, there's four companies plus us, um, and they've all got their own areas of expertise. Um, and working together, we deliver full service, um, but we also work individually, um, focusing on our specific area of expertise as well, but uh, we collaborate um, regularly on various projects um, as well. So that's the intros. Uh, we'll get into the meat of it. So collaboration. 
it's one of those words that make you roll your eyes and go, oh, no, again, I know all about collaboration. It's an overused word. Um, and perhaps it will make you switch off. But um, it is really important. And good collaboration within an organization leads to lots of great things. Um, so improved efficiency, because people aren't spending time doing the same thing with organization, increased job satisfaction, uh, higher employee retention, um, closer alignment to company values, and a whole bunch of other, um, other great things. If you're a moray eel, it can also lead to clean teeth. Um, if you're a shrimp, it can lead to a free meal. So it's, um, it's a splendid thing. Without it, of course, things don't work so well. Uh, a lack of communication and corresponding increase in silos is often a problem. Um, we quite regularly work for large clients where we're talking to two bits of the same organization um, and end up telling them that somebody else in their organization is doing a really similar project somewhere else. And it's somebody they're not aware of and sometimes they haven't met. Um, so uh, if collaboration doesn't happen, then that's a possibility. Um, so lower employee engagement, a lack of innovation and lots of missed opportunities. So I think we can all agree that uh, it's a great thing. Um, Bunnyfoot's an evidence-driven design consultancy, not a management consultancy, so I'm not here to say, this is how you make um, collaboration happen, make yourself a collaborative organization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can, I, can I just check that people can hear? I assume, yeah. Okay, so it's working for some people and not for others. It looks like it's working for the majority now, and the person who couldn't, Mike, I think is all good. Okay, you can now. Oh, thank goodness, I thought I was gonna have to start again. Um, okay, just let me, wonder I was, that threw me off my stride. So, um, uh, a bit of collaboration coming up. So, um, Partly out of nosiness on my part, um, because it's always interesting to hear what other people are doing. Um, I was going to um, uh, just mention some ways that within Bunnyfoot, we manage um, our collaboration, um, but it would be really interesting um, to hear what, how you all manage it as well. How do you increase collaboration in your organization, particularly um, at this time when we can't actually spend any time together? Uh, so I'll, I'll run through a few things that, that we do here, but um, throw some up on the, um, on the chat as well. Uh, make me know I'm not alone. Um, and we'll throw those into the mix as well. Uh, so here at Bunnyfoot, um, we have a bit of an extra challenge with our three offices and some home workers as well, but we start every week with a company-wide meeting. Um, we call it WIV, which stands for Week in View, and I have no idea why we call it that. It's always been called that, and I don't think anybody who's here was there at the beginning, so um, so we don't know. But we celebrate our successes. We talk about projects, we uh, projects that have happened and things that um, uh, are coming up that we might need help with. Uh, we share what we've learned um, during the previous week. Um, we have regular sessions, I'm sure a lot of you do, lunch and learns, uh, we call them brain foods where different people present different things. Um, we have a private Facebook group page, which we use, it's much more informal, we use it for sharing links and photos and observations at a company level if we want, rather than emailing all, uh, we put stuff up there. Um, we have company-wide training days and celebrations at various subgroups on Skype and Teams to keep conversations open. Um, and resourcing is managed at a company level rather than a location level um, to encourage collaboration between those offices. Um, here we all are collaborating over some beer. Nobody's sharing with me. Come on, collaborate. Thank you, Dan. So use Miro and Jamboard. Um, okay, so I'm familiar with Miro, but I'm not with Jamboard. I assume the two things are, are similar. Uh, Okay, you're obviously all shy and not collaborating. Um, <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, lots of people, Slack, Miro, that sort of thing. Mural, Zoom, hooray! People are 
moving on. So there are lots of things there that, um, that you can see, um, lots of Teams and Zoom. mural for online workshops a virtual coffee break mm. yeah and i'm sure lots of you have been doing quizzes um as well seem to have become very popular um during lockdown that's brilliant thank you very much uh so that's uh collaborating within your own team or organization um is perhaps easy um probably uh but what about beyond um, those boundaries. So for us at Bonifoot and, and maybe for some of you as well, that usually means collaborating with our clients. Um, and that's just as important for us as working well with our colleagues. Um, there's, you know, nothing creates an enormous amount of stress than having to deal with a difficult relationship, whether, you know, that's internally, but also externally as well, it just makes everything um, more difficult. Uh, but it, it might seem that, um, you know, as a consultancy, we're just providing a service, um, and isn't that enough? Um, but for us, the important thing and something that we always tell our clients is that we, we want to work with you and not for you. And there are lots of benefits of that level of collaboration. So um, just a few there that we've identified. So we believe that we deliver better results if we know some of what our clients know. Um, they're the experts in their business, and we need some of that information to do uh, as good a job as we can. So um, that's an important part of the evidence in our evidence-driven um, approach. Uh, it helps us to engage with a wider group of stakeholders beyond the immediate project team. Um, it's very easy to do a whole project and just uh, communicate with a couple of people within that business, but it's much uh, more beneficial for us to, to learn about what lots of people know, people on the shop floor at different levels, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and doing that also uh, increases acceptance and adoption of our recommendations and designs. Um, it helps people understand what our approach is um, and to make sure that we're not coming up with a solution that doesn't work um, in context. Um, it helps us identify barriers as early as possible um, and uh, overcome them. I'm not sure overcome me. I'm not quite sure why I wrote that. Uh, build strong relationships. Um, moving forward so that we can um, identify other opportunities and continue uh, that relationship going it ensures that there are no surprises or more importantly disappointments um, if we have a big reveal at the end and there's that blank face and a, well that isn't what we wanted um, it's definitely not something that we're looking for um, and finally we believe in knowledge sharing we're not precious about what we do uh, when we're working with our clients we they quite often uh, want to learn stuff that they can reuse later and um, we're really happy for that to happen so um, lots of um, opportunities for collaboration beyond uh, beyond our team but um, obviously it's all very well in theory um, you can't just shout right collaborate although I obviously did try that with you and it did work because I got lots of answers um, but it's um, generally not so successful um, with clients uh, and that's where collaborative um, design comes in uh, bear with me. So before we start on um, collaborative design, just a really quick detour into design thinking um, to provide a bit of context. So I'm not going to go into it in masses of detail. We covered it in a recent workshop back in the days when we were allowed uh, to get together in person. Um, and we have mm -hmm. um, a course uh, that covers it in a lot of detail that I can tell you about at the end. Um, but um, collaborative design is a really key part of the design thinking process. And so really, this is just to explain where it sits within that. Uh, a quick Google, if you Google design thinking, um, you get many, many ways um, of defining and conceptualizing how it works, lots of pretty diagrams and good explanations um, of what it is. So I've picked one of those, um, one of the simplest that I could find. Uh, so, um, it'll serve our purpose uh, for today, just to keep it simple. So the important thing um, is the idea that design thinking involves, first of all, understanding and defining the problem that you're trying to solve. So that's that first diamond there um, um, through observation and research, uh, both with users, but also within the organization. Um, coming out with lots and lots of ideas and then um, narrowing those down to make sure that 
you know that the problem you're dealing with is the right problem. Uh, and then the, the second diamond is um, more divergent thinking to find the right solution for that problem, um, looking at all the possible solutions before narrowing it down through prototyping and testing to make sure that what you deliver is the right one. And that's um, the quickest summary of design thinking um, that you can have. It, um, it requires a cycle of uh, divergent and convergent thinking um, to generate those ideas. So the divergent thinking that happens um, at the beginning of those two diamonds, um, for divergent thinking, it's all about ideas and approaches. You want lots of ideas. Uh, people need to be open. Everything is permitted. And that's where it's really important uh, for us to try and open it up and increase that collaboration to generate lots of ideas and to get a really good understanding of what we're dealing with. Um, but collaboration is also important um, in the convergent stage because when you're choosing the the problem or indeed the solution um, that you're going to work with uh, you need to make sure that the context is right that it's feasible and um, you're going in the right direction and we need that input from clients in order to uh, make that work for us so um, we know at the beginning that we're designing the right thing but also in the second diamond that um, that we're designing it right and that's the, the sort of the two elements of um, design thinking to get there So collaboration, um, the divergent thinking, um, sorry, Thomas Edison there, uh, he knew all about divergent thinking. Um, he knew that he wasn't kind of going to come up um, with the one idea as the first one. Uh, your first idea is rarely going to be right. You need volume. Um, I'm not sure we ever come up with 10,000 ideas for one project, but um, uh, certainly a large number of them. And if those ideas can come from a variety of people and perspectives, then it's even better. Um, John Stuart Mill, a British philosopher, uh, economist, and a very rich source of quotes. If you ever need a quote, I'm sure he's got one that you can use for almost any, uh, for any purpose. So it's hardly possible to overrate the value of placing human beings in contact with persons dissimilar to themselves. Um, so that's, that's where, uh, in our world, the collaborative design um, comes into it. The more we can mix people up and, and perhaps put different people together, then we'll generate um, a wider variety of ideas to choose from. And that's sometimes where um, the great ideas uh, start. Uh, unfortunately, um, most people, not all, and maybe that's part of the problem, are reluctant to put their ideas out there. Uh, we can be a little bit um, nervous about exposing um, what we think in that way. So we need to coax and wheedle to make sure that um, that we hear from everybody uh, and that we don't hear too much from a small number of people. And um, that's where collaborative design comes in. Uh, so what is it? Um, sometimes easier to define things by what it isn't. Um, we hear quite a lot, oh, collaborative design, that's just brainstorming. We'll get into a room and talk about ideas. Um, it isn't that. For the reasons I just mentioned, you tend to hear um, from that, that hippo or certainly the most confident and loudest person in the room and the people who have um, equally good ideas but perhaps aren't as um, willing or confident to put them out there go unheard. Uh, so it isn't that. Um, it certainly isn't something that only designers can do. As we said, we need lots of people to create those diverse uh, insight and ideas. And neither is it a replacement for the interaction designers who are there as part of that process, but really come into their own later on where they're taking those ideas or that one idea that we've mm -hmm. got and developing those um, down the line. Mm. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of those exercises mm. that we can use in um, collaborative uh, design workshops or in a number of different workshops that we use. Uh, so um, Amy is going to kick off by talking about design the box and then I'm just going to hand over to Bex to talk about post the path uh, and I'll finish up with a quick bit of empathy mapping. Um, so yeah, over to Amy. Hello. Okay, so one of the methods that we use when we're running collaborative sessions is something called design the box. 
Um, so this is basically where we get participants to work in groups to collaboratively design cereal boxes, kind of cereal box size, blank boxes, um, and we get them to think about that as representing whatever it is that we're working to redesign. So that could be uh, a landing page for a website, it could be an entire product, an entire service, a website in its entirety, or an app, whatever it is that we're working with that particular client on. And the reason that we like to use this particular method is that it's a really great way to get people to work together and collaborate to refine what the key messaging is about, let's say, for example, the website in this case, um, and to visually communicate those USPs and to present them in a way that's going to be user friendly. It also gets people to think about different sorts of persuasive techniques that they can use. So thinking about how they can actually frame their service in a way that's going to encourage prospective users to engage with it. If you think about walking into a supermarket and having lots of different choices of products on a shelf, there's going to be something that draws your eye to one over any of the others. And this is kind of trying to get people to think in that sort of way. So working out actually what is the core message? What is it that we want to communicate? And how are we going to make that stand out um, in a potentially crowded marketplace? And it's, it's quite a fun activity as well. People quite enjoy it. It's quite hands on. It's quite lo fi as well. So people are maybe a little bit less uh, fearful of putting their creative ideas onto the box and collaborating in that way. And it really forces people to focus on what are the most important things that they're trying to communicate about their product or service. So some tips for how to actually use this method. Um, essentially, you give each group that you've got a blank box really practical tip we if we're going to a workshop in person we will take these flat packed so that we don't have to lug loads of made up boxes with us and and you can give that as an activity to the groups initially to actually assemble their boxes you could even make it into a warm-up thing and make it a bit of a race or something like that um, and give them some tools to decorate their boxes with so you either keep it really lo-fi just some sharpies you might want to make it a bit more exciting with some colored sharpies um, or you can even add whatever else you want to, stickers, glitter, anything that you've got in your, your stationary cupboards, bring it out and um, get people to use those things as well. And then what we say to people to introduce the activity is to essentially ask them to imagine that whatever it is we're designing, the website in question is a product on a shelf in the supermarket alongside other products. And then we get them to consider a number of different things as they're thinking about what is it they're going to put onto this box. We get them to think about what is it that users actually want and need from this site in order to be able to make a decision about what their next step is um, or a more fundamental decision about what they think about the company or the organization. So what actually is the core proposition that we want to communicate? How can we communicate what people need to know? So what are the key questions that people are coming with? as they're, they're trying to make a decision about what their next step is going to be and how can you answer those questions in a way that's going to help them um, to get that information quickly. Um, what are the benefits? So I talked about you know standing in that supermarket and having to make a decision. How does this box differ from the others that are on the shelf? And it could be, you know, you think about an actual cereal box, you, you see the big messages on the front and then you might pick it up and you might compare nutritional values of different products on the back to make a decision. So we get people to think about how are those key messages on the front of the box going to contrast with the, the detailed stuff on the back and on the sides. Um, things like what's going to actually engage people, what's going to excite them, um, and how can you persuade them that this is the best thing for them? So again, utilising some of those persuasive techniques. Now you can see here on this slide uh, an example. This is just one box um, from a workshop that we ran with a cultural institution in London. Um, and for this particular workshop, we got people to um, work in groups and each group was assigned one of their personas. Um, and so this one, I think, was the, the school teacher persona this group had. So they were designing from that perspective, thinking about what are the key questions? What's the key information that this school teacher is going to want to know from our website about engaging with us as a cultural institution? So you can see on the front here school trip in a box and it's got this key messaging about easy booking and the price per child so those are obviously quite key things empathizing with the fact that this teacher is going to be busy um, they're going to want something that's quick and easy to book it's not going to take them a long time 
but also that they're going to have budgets in mind. Um, so they, they need that key information of how much is this actually going to cost? Is it feasible? And then on the other picture, you can see the back, some more of the detail. Um, so we've got things about uh, the, the sorts of activities that are available at the site. Um, we've got information about how it relates to different key stages, different package prices available on the back. And at the end of the day, in this workshop, we ended up with several of these different boxes, each of them targeting a different persona for each group. So they look quite different, but it was really helpful because it enabled us to see what the stakeholders felt was the key messages that they wanted to get across um, and the key questions that these different audience types were going to have as they were coming to their site. And that enabled us then, as we moved forward through the project, to, to think about translating that into specific landing pages aimed at these different audience types. And obviously to iterate that and test that and validate that that actually was the information um, that these different audience types were wanting to see and to then go from there and improve on it as we went. So it's a really fun activity. Um, it's, yeah, as I say, a real, really good way of getting people to focus in on that, that key messaging. And you end up with um, some quite good visual artifacts at the end of the day, which you can obviously capture in photographs and um, keep that way. Just remember to take a bag with you to carry all the boxes home with. <laughs> home with. I'm going to hand over to Bex now. She's going to talk about another method. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see you. Um, I'm going to talk about a method called post to path. Um, some of you on the call may have even done this with me in a workshop. I don't know. So what on earth is post the path? Well, it is a way that um, participants in in your workshop, collaboratively construct a map of the detailed steps um, users take to complete a task or journey. Um, so you can use this method with users um, or with stakeholders. Why do it? Well, it's a great way to understand the variety of different mental models that exist about how a task or journey currently happens. And you can identify any contradicting views on how this happens. Um, and by involving different stakeholders representing different areas of the business or uh, different um, kind of uh, amounts of contact that they actually have with real users as well. And by involving those different stakeholders, you're going to have a lot more knowledge about different parts of the process. Um, and stakeholders can learn from each other going through this process. Um, and you get more, a more complete picture um, of the process, or perhaps more accurately, the assumptions that exist um, about that task or journey in the organisation. So you can see this little picture here on the slide. Um, it gives you a, a hint of how it works um, with different coloured post-its and different steps in a journey. But I'll go into more detail about that now. So... <clears throat> So um, before you start, um, you do need to identify the user and the journey that you're going to tackle. And you may well, um, that may well be informed by another exercise in your collaborative workshop where you explore your audiences and what you know about them and perhaps do a sketch persona exercise and, and so on. Um, but once you've kind of decided, right, for this user, this is a really important journey or task, then you can move into your post the path. So, um, and as um, Ali was saying earlier, um, this exercise, even in itself, it involves um, divergent thinking um, and then refining, so convergent thinking. So it kind of goes through that pattern um, um, uh, as we talked about design thinking earlier. So to start off, everybody working individually, so you've got that time to, to think as an individual yourself about this process, Everybody writes down all the steps in the journey, one step uh, per post-it note, um, and ideally as few as possible steps. Um, and each person has a different colour of post-it note, hence in that uh, image before the different colours of post-its, so you know um, what is coming from where. Whilst they're doing this, ask them to think about any information that needs to be gathered from the user at each step information that needs to be given to the user at each step and the order in which the steps need to happen. 
Um, and um, that's great because it enriches the information and, uh, and, and starts to get you thinking, I guess, or, or equipping you with, with more layers of information that you're going to have to consider um, when you start designing solutions. So <clears throat> uh, once they've done this as an individual task, they uh, you can perhaps group people together into three or four and they stick their versions of the journey up on the wall, aligning them so that the same or similar steps are in columns. Um, and you ask them to work as a group to look for consistencies, points of confusion, places where something magical happens. Are there areas of lack of clarity? Are there redundancies in the steps? Um, is there terminology that's being used that's problematic? Um, so you can layer on all sorts of uh, questions interrogating your, your model that gets created, if you like. There's bound to be surprises. There'll be different views of the journey and opinions of problem areas, for example, will definitely emerge. <clears throat> so finally, um, you get the group in the last stage to refine their journey to try to reach consensus on one, one version. And it may well be that your different stakeholders in the group are kind of filling in gaps of knowledge and, and, and steps um, for each other with this. And you have a mix of colours of post-it note in your final refined journey. So that's the essence of, of the post of path. You can see in the imagery here as well um, how um, an example from one workshop that we run kind of got written up, if you like, with the steps of each step in the process and um, um, a, a row for what information is needed, a row for what information um, needs to be given to the user and, and got from the user and any notes. And that's the great thing that you can keep kind of interrogating and layering on extra bits of insight um, with, with this. So um, why do I like this method? Well, it's simple. Um, but it goes quite deep. So all you need really are post-it notes and a space um, wall or virtual space, because of course you could do this using a virtual tool. Um, and, uh, and the fact that you can keep going deeper. For example, you might ask um, people uh, what they know about user satisfaction for each of the different points in the process. Um, what triggers complaints? Can they share evidence about that? So you start to uncover um, more evidence um, to, to drive your design. My big tip for this exercise is that um, do a quick practice run by giving a stated task that everyone will have experience of. So it builds confidence um, and can lead to a richer output in the, the real thing. So for example, you might get everybody to um, do a, a, um, their steps for, um, I don't know, buying a jumper from the John Lewis website or something like that, uh, just to get them started and into it. And it also means that any questions that might emerge about how the process works can happen with that and everybody's more confident moving forward when they're, they're tackling it for a task for their um, own organisation. So there we go, that is Post the Path. I will hand back to Ali now. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about something much simpler um, than either of those things, um, but perhaps a, a quick one that uh, it's it's easy to build into um, to other meetings, uh, easy to get going with. So that's empathy mapping, and I'm sure um, lots of you are familiar with this already. So empathy mapping is a way of helping participants in a in a workshop or helping um, team members consider an experience from their customer's point of view, which might seem obvious, but uh, it's something that a lot of people um, have just never done before. And this is a, a sort of semi-structured way of helping them do that. Um, so uh, it's sometimes used as a way uh, after you've done research and a way of organizing insight from research and basing it on um, actual uh, insights or uh, results that you've got from whatever research you've done, but it can also uh, just provide structure. If you're saying to people, imagine what it's going to be like, um, that can be a really difficult thing to do. And it can really help if you can give them a structure for that imagining process. Uh, so rather than just saying, imagining how it is, 
um, imagine um, what that person is thinking, um, what is that person seeing, that sort of thing. So it really um, helps to provide those categories and some prompts within those categories as well. Um, it can encourage discussion um, and quite often brings to light uh, different understandings of what people think their customers are or what their customers are experiencing. So it can be really useful for doing that as well. Um, it's really quick and really easy to explain, something that can be built in um, to a workshop at, at top speed. It works really well online as well. So um, even if you're running this remotely, uh, it's a good one for that. Um, so it's there's not much to explain about it in, in um, the way that uh, Bex and Amy have done, um, but it can be done individually or in a group. Um, so you can get people to do it on their own and then come together or to generate discussion by doing it um, as a group. You can provide a, a pre-printed sheet um, like that. Again, if you uh, if you Google empathy mapping, it'll come up with um, a whole load of um, different ways of doing it. I'm just looking on the, the chat. Deborah saying that she's set up a, uh, an empathy mapping board in Mirror, and I've got one that, that we use as well. So um, you can uh, have a look at hers on that link there. Thanks, Deborah. Um, uh, but essentially, a piece of paper, some post-it notes or a pen is all you need. Um, divide them into those categories, thinking, feeling, saying, doing, seeing, hearing. Um, combine those if you want. Use some and not the others. Um, and just encourage people to, uh, within those categories, um, say what they think um, customers are doing. You can assign customer types to groups or individuals and um, look at it from that direction as well. Um, so it's uh, it's dead easy. It's dead quick. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a good one for warming people up and getting them going um, uh, as well, I think. So um, collaborating uh, can be a bit of a challenge when we're free to meet and can all get together. And it can seem um, impossible um, when we can't even get in a room together. So how does that work? Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, collaborative design in the world of coronavirus and how we've been managing that. Um, some tips for managing those workshops if you're running them remotely as well. Um, we think, or it certainly seems to be coming to light, that encouraging collaboration now when we can't get together um, is even more important than it was um, when we were free to get together in a meeting room and have those workshops or have those discussions. Uh, it may feel uh, for you like it certainly does sometimes for me that your day is one long Zoom call and that, oh, yeah, I'm collaborating nonstop because I'm constantly on the phone or on Zoom or um uh, one of the other uh, uh, apps talking to people all the time. But we think you're probably, or certainly what we found is that people are talking to a more limited set of colleagues um, and that communication is more intentional than when you're together. So you set up a call for a reason, um, you fulfill that reason, and then you leave. I know um, in the chat we were saying, you know, we have uh, virtual coffee mornings and things like that, um, but probably... Uh, that happens within a, a defined group of people. Um, we were The quote that's here is one that came up in conversation a couple of days ago with one of our clients, and we weren't talking about this, it was a different conversation and just popped up. Um, and he said, it's reinforced established teams and structures, and it's really limited cross-team and cross-organization collaboration. So people feel as though they're talking more, but they're not, um, they're sort of becoming more narrow in terms of uh, in terms of their conversations so anything you can do to push those conversations out um, for us in terms of design projects uh, then um, we're trying to do that and making a real conscious effort um, to sort of push beyond those um, obvious boundaries uh, it, it might seem a bit intimidating or you might think well that can't happen but it can be done with forward planning um, as long as you've got a, a reasonable wireless connection I guess you could do it over the phone and it can work um, really well so you know don't don't shy away from it um, what I'm going to do now is is look at um, some positive aspects and benefits of running things remotely uh, and then the challenges of running them remotely as we did with the last um, 
the last one. If you've got any ideas of or any anything uh, to share, either um, benefits or challenges that you think you might come up again, and this might help with the Q and A as well. If you can think of um, challenges that you think, well, I couldn't do that because it would be too difficult for this reason. Pop that up there because that might that, that might see uh, some questions that we can um, look at at the end as well. Uh, I was told that there was a bit of a delay, so I was uh, berating you all for not responding to my to my plea. But there's apparently a delay before I see it up on my screen. So uh, apologies if I was a bit mean to you. Um, I'll be nicer this time. So. Um, for us, in terms of um, for benefits, uh, what we found running re um, collaborative workshops remotely is that obviously there's a lower cost involved. We're scattered around the country and um, our clients tend to be elsewhere. It always seems to be. So certainly I'm based up in the Sheffield office. I spend a lot of my time um, on the train down to London uh, to run workshops. Um, and we're saving some money um, by not having to do that. Uh, also, we're not spending money on uh, our vast post-it note budget has, uh, can be reduced because we're not um, having to go through quite the number that we were before. Uh, it can be easier to arrange. We found that, you know, sometimes it's really difficult to get hold of lots of um, particularly senior stakeholders on the same day because they're off busy doing other things. And at the moment, we've got a bit of a captive audience. They're not going anywhere. And while they're really busy, they're not having to commit as much time because of um, uh, because of travel so it can be easier to get those people into the same room uh, there's no write-up hooray because everything if you're using Miro or something like that everything um, is captured as you go and then you've just got it there and you can um, export that as a pdf and send it to your client and go look I've written it up here it is and uh, so it, it speeds the process up uh, we're finding and maybe you've seen some articles about this um, during lockdown that actually it's working really well for some people um, perhaps more introverted people are completely happy staying at home and more comfortable contributing online than um, perhaps they would if they're experiencing the challenges of uh, dealing with a workshop like that face to face particularly if it's with people they don't know or they're not comfortable um, contributing to um, so that can work um, really well as well uh, it can provide an opportunity to invite people who couldn't normally be included. So if there are shop floor people who wouldn't be available or, um, I don't know, people who work shifts or um, people at a higher level who wouldn't be available, it's just sort of opened that um, forum out for us, really. And we found it that it's easier to get more people involved if we want to. Um, and there's a lower carbon footprint. Uh, we're not um, using... Uh, physical post-it notes or lots of paper or Sharpies. And it is really nice to get your hands on those things and be creative with them. Um, but there's obviously an overhead that comes with that. And also the travel um, is saving on the carbon footprint as well. Uh, and with um, another benefit, it makes global collaboration possible. Absolutely. Um, it's a really good point um, that uh, we are doing international work and we can um, get people involved. Um, some challenges, of course, there are challenges. It's still all a bit weird. And this is weird for us. Um, it'd be much easier to be standing up in front of somebody and I could see you all and see if you're yawning and looking at your phones. Uh, or maybe it's nice that I can't see that. Um, but it is still a bit strange talking into this void. Um, there are always technical issues. Never had any workshop or meeting or anything where somebody has got their mic on mute or they haven't got the right kit, their connection isn't fast enough. So many things can go wrong and um, seem to go wrong as soon as I go anywhere near them. So um, there is always that. Uh, th th those serendipitous conversations that happen. So we, we plan workshops and we have an agenda and we run them all perfectly, but quite often the best conversations that we have are the ones um, that happen in the breaks when we're having a cup of coffee or that happen over lunch. Um, when people feel perhaps a bit more relaxed and a little less on show um, and you lose that opportunity. Um, you can um, keep the connection open during breaks and perhaps encourage that um, sort of coffee break kind of mentality, which might help a little bit. Um, it necessarily has really to be a more structured environment. Everything's been set up and you're, you, you know, it, 
it, it tends to be more structured in that way. Maybe that's not conducive to wild and imaginative thinking. Um, the exercises do help, um, but it can, yeah, it can feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and obviously you can't use things that we might sometimes use like uh, um, Lego Serious Play or Play-Doh, all of that stuff. Um, we can't use and you can't do those exercises where you're drawing and passing on or anything like that. So you, you have fewer things available, but there's still plenty that you can choose from to get the results um, that you need. Oh, look at that uh, technical issue, just as I'm talking about technical issues. Um, hopefully um, Bruno can restart and come back. Um, and another challenge, getting others to provide feedback. Um, I guess other people within the um, within the workshop. It can be, um, yeah. It's uh, it can help if you. It's a bit like running a focus group, I guess, and having a list of um, uh, making sure that you're specifically asking individuals for feedback if they haven't contributed. Um, but it, you know, it, it can be, and um, as Caroline says, absolutely, some people aren't comfortable online and they and they clam up I think hopefully we're all getting a bit more used to uh, managing things online um, and I know that um, I can't remember who I was talking to but the latest release of Zoom lets you turn your own picture off which seems really simple um, but it is kind of off-putting uh, you know I can see myself talking in the bottom left hand side of, of my screen and um, it's of putting seeing yourself. So their their new release lets you turn off your own picture, so everyone can still see you, but you can't see yourself. Um, and yeah, having um, having to take turns, lots of other things um, coming up on the right hand side that are you know good ideas. Uh, let me come back to the question, but yeah, we'll look at that in the Q and A at the end. Um, so in the um, uh, when we were, I was asking at the beginning about um, what methods you all use for collaborating. There were a vast array of things came up, and some comments about there are so many; it's difficult to keep track of them all. It's easier to consolidate, um, and I think that's absolutely right. What what we tend to use for our workshops um, is a mixture of Zoom and Miro. Um, and that seems to work reasonably well. Um, so this is an example of a persona workshop um, that I ran a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and um, I, I can't remember who it was, but as the person who um, shared their link for a Miro template, we did a, uh, for empathy mapping, we did a, a, a similar thing here. So this um, moving from left to right, we've got a warm up exercise, some blank canvas that people could use to scribble on, um, looking at grouping their existing customers, um, then a line of uh, empathy maps, um, moving on to uh, persona, sketch personas that we got people to do, and then some um, uh, dimensions at the end. So that was a, um, that was a whole workshop. It lasted, I, I think, about three hours with breaks, um, and we worked our way through it. And alongside that, we had a Zoom call, much like this one, where we were talking on it as well. Um, so we did include this um, um, in our last online session um, that we did, uh, which was about um, doing research. Uh, remotely, we included some tips. Um, so I don't want to rake over old ground too much, but I just thought I'd put some in here specifically about um, running remote workshops in case that was um, useful for you. Uh, and I think the first one that, that we put is is be brave. Um, you know, just just do it. Um, when we first got into this situation, we're like, oh my god, we're going to have to run workshops. Well, it's all very well doing testing remotely. We do that anyway. That's easy. But how are we going to manage running a whole stakeholder workshop? A whole um, collaborative design workshop um, and it and it does work um, it may seem daunting but um, just have a go it were, it, we were surprised at how successful it was and how much people enjoyed it um, one of the most important things I think is um, taking time to prepare um, and test that ahead of time make sure that you're really familiar and comfortable with the technology you'll be using um, and that your templates are in the right order and follow your agenda 
um, uh, that sort of thing. It's um, also make sure your participants know what to expect as well. Make sure that they have everything they need to join in. Do that bit of planning um, uh, in advance and it will make things work much better. If you can and it's appropriate, um, it's really good to have a conversation with the people that are going to be in your workshop because um, if you can identify the people who are feeling a bit anxious or who like to work in a certain way, then you can help them to uh, participate more fully by incorporating those needs in. Um, it's not always possible, but if you can, um, that can be helpful. Um, we found that if you're using a combination of apps, so when we're using Miro and Zoom together, it's much, much easier if both you as the moderator and the participants can have two screens or devices running simultaneously. And that's, um, it's not like for us when we're in the office and we've got a nice bank of screens that we can use. Um, Sometimes people are on phones and tablets and things like that. So if they can, it's, um, it's useful. Uh, make sure that you do a tour of the apps um, and a warm-up exercise that helps people become familiar um, with it and gives people a chance to practice. Um, using breakout rooms can be really helpful. It gives people privacy, even if there's just single people in those rooms. It's, it means that they don't feel as though they've got people looking over their shoulder all the time, which can be really um, off-putting. Um, Ensure that the instructions are, are written perhaps in more detail than you would normally, because if they're in breakout rooms, they can't ask questions. So make sure that they stay visible and are really explicit about what you want to do and include plenty of breaks because it's really exhausting to have all this technology going on, to be on a video call, as well as having to have crazy imaginative ideas. Um, and it gives you a break as well. Um, so that's um, you know useful to build those those breaks. Um, those breaks in. So that's um, that brings us to the end of um, what we've got for you today in, in terms of our presentation. Um, so hopefully that was useful for you. Um, if you want to know more, if you want to find out more about the techniques that we've been talking about, um, we have this uh, suite of um, training courses. Uh, the one that would cover most of what we've been talking about is number six on there. So co-creation, ideation, innovation. Um, and we're doing uh, 100 pound off those remote courses at the moment. We're still running them now um, using all the, the things that I've been talking about um, and they're running remotely. Um, we thought people might have more time at the moment um, to attend. So uh, we're, we're still doing them. Um, so a bit of, Q&A, we've got a little bit of time. I think Bex is going to moderate the Q&A while I have a drink. Thanks, Bex. Okay, so we have a few questions that have come in um, and I'm sure uh, Amy and Ali are gonna assist me in uh, answering them too. But our top upvoted one um, is, how many people is too many for a remote collaboration session? Um, so, I think this annoyingly is one of those questions which to which the answer is it depends. And one of the things that it depends on is what your ambition is to get out of the, the workshop. Um, how, uh, how many activities you, you want to do. Um, are you actually able to split it into a series of, of workshops and so on? Because without a doubt, um, it takes a bit longer when you're doing things remotely than it does face to face. Um, I've certainly found that with delivering training online as well. Um, you know, you, you're splitting people into breakout rooms, bringing them back again, making sure everyone has the chance. It's just that to speak and it's just that little bit slower. Um, uh, it also, I think, depends on the um, technology that you're going to use. So I've, you've just heard me automatically talk about breakout rooms there. Um, you know, if you're all constrained in 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 one um, group uh, chat or presentation, um, then that's very different from being able to split people up into their groups of three or four. Um, and as the moderator of the session, if you like, kind of check in on them and they can ask you for help and you can see what's going on and then bring the whole group back. Um, that's that's very different. You can maybe manage 12 people just like a normal um, face to face workshop like that. 
Um, whereas, yeah, if you if you haven't got that facility in the tech that you're using, um, then you might want to, to look at a, a smaller number for your collaboration session. Um, Amy, is there anything you would add to that? Um, no, just to say that with the number of people as it increases, as Bex was saying, you're going to have less time for people to be able to feedback. So you might want to consider the amount of stuff that you're trying to get through um, and maybe focus in on a few things or split it into two sessions rather than having one longer one. Um, I think, as Ali mentioned earlier, people do get quite tired um, quite easily when they're doing video calls and collaborating in this sort of remote way. So making plenty of time for breaks and having shorter, more focused sessions rather than longer sessions with lots of people, I think is a good um, There's a similar question in there. Is there an ideal number of people to have for the post the path workshop? Well, um, as I say, that might be just one of the exercises you're doing in the workshop. But um, uh, when I've done this in the past, um, in order to maximise the coverage of personas and tasks, I've actually split the group of perhaps 12 people up into groups of um, three. Um, and each of those groups takes one persona and one task and works on that. Um, and so breakout rooms would be very helpful. Um, or it may be that you have a persona or a user with a number of tasks and you can split the groups up to handle different tasks. Um, but if it's a journey that traverses particular aspects of, you know, group, uh, teams in the organisation um, and what they know, then you might be thinking, right, OK, actually, we need five or six people to take part in this so that we're getting good coverage of, of all the aspects of the process. So, um, yeah, also relating to the post the path, there was another question. Um, do you ask participants to create the existing user journey or the ideal user journey? Well, um, it is an exercise that is really useful for both. So it depends at what point in your human centered design process you are, whether you're trying to establish at the beginning what the internal view is of um, or if you're doing it with users, the, the user users view of what the, the task steps are or whether you're trying to envision how um, it will be in the future with um, um, the, the ideal experience, if you like, that you want to deliver. We have another question um, that's been upvoted. How do you stop colleagues jumping to the solution rather than exploring the problem? Um, well, I think um, all of these exercises and structuring your collaborative sessions um, using methods which take walk people through thinking and, and you know they have to, to, to go through these steps is all part of uh, making sure that you're exploring the, the problem rather than jumping to the solution whereas if you got everyone into a room and said oh let's have a chat about this topic today that's when you would get everybody um, jumping perhaps to solutionizing rather than exploring the the problem so you know these are all really good tools to help you manage that process mm -hmm. um, again Ali or, or Amy would you add anything to that something else I sometimes do is create what I call a car park um, so any discussions that are happening where I just sort of think oh that's sort of we're getting bogged down in that conversation and I don't want us to focus on that literally mm -hmm. create an area so if you're physically there pop it up on a wall and stick it on a post-it note whatever that topic of conversation is or do that virtually um, and sort of almost ban that conversation for another time and say yeah we've recognized this that it's something that's important for us to talk about but it's not the focus of today's session so it's recognized but you then move on yeah and it's getting people to always try to think about the needs um, of the users rather than um, the, the the means um, the means that they, they they they're thinking of to 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 uh, um, create the feature or whatever that they think is the way to solve the problem. So, um, huh. Ian Merry, what is your current favourite workshop method for remote collaboration? Um, I'm going to throw that to to Ali or or Amy. Would you like to pick up? What's your favourite? Oh, so many that are good. Um, one of the ones that I really like using is um, service blueprinting, and that works really well remotely as well as in person. 
Um, so for those who aren't familiar with it, essentially it is similar-ish to what Bex was talking about with Post the Path, but you're getting people to map out an entire service journey from end to end, and then you get them to layer on additional things. So everything that is going on um, sort of on stage, so things that customers are, are aware of and interactions that they're having directly with um, on stage staff and then everything that's happening behind the scenes. So interactions between members of staff, interactions between staff and um, off stage systems. Um, and you map all of that out across an entire service journey. And it's really, really useful way to see where efficiencies can be made, to see where there's um, particular pain points, um, to see where there's elements where, yeah, th things are maybe a bit confusing. Um, in terms of why the journey is set up in the way that, that it is. Um, and also, again, talking about this whole thing of collaboration, making sure that you have a diverse group of people there who have got different perspectives, who maybe are from those different um, categories of person, if you like, so on stage staff, off stage staff, um, who can actually contribute from their viewpoint. And it helps to build empathy across different teams as well um, and see how often people are very focused on their particular area. Um, that they're working on and their particular piece of the puzzle, but actually getting them to sort of lift their eyes and have an understanding of what comes before and after their bit of the process that a customer might be interacting with. So that's currently one of my favourites. Um, not not necessarily one of my favourites, but something that, that Miro does particularly well um, that I found when I was uh, doing a persona workshop is uh, doing sketch personas, which do work really well. Um, remotely is that Miro lets you um, go hunting for uh, images on um, th on the internet. Uh, if you're doing sketch personas, normally we get people to draw, uh, um, you know, just sketch funny pictures of the personas that, that, that they're doing. Um, and they're reluctant to do it, but then they really love it. And I was thinking, how, how can we incorporate that bit? But Miro does let you go off hunting. People find some amazing photos of their uh, of their sketch personas to put in there so that's just it's just um something that works particularly well if you tell people how they can go and find photos for that through mirror okay um i'm aware we're running out of um time or our time is actually up but um there is a question here that um i will uh try to address um can you please explain how you see personas working for product teams in an agile tech company? Um, I, it, without more detail, Dan, it's hard to um, to get to the nub of exactly what you mean. But um, I almost feel like this is, I mean, personas are just a, a design tool that are based on lots of um, um, evidence and, and research and, and um and knowledge that you've gathered through your research about your users. So is this a question of um, how do we make sure we incorporate <laughs> the, the, um, any research with our users or indeed do any research with our users when we're um, uh, operating in an agile environment? Um, and I come across this question a lot in teaching the uh, CPUX Foundation course. We have a lot of discussions about different people's experiences of trying to either operate in a lean way or integrate UX um, with, with Agile. Um, so it's a kind of a perennial problem. And different organizations um, tackle it in different ways. So, you know, um, you may still have that upfront um, period where you spend time doing your research, gathering your evidence um, and creating um, your well-informed models and view of your user, which is then going to be hopefully a, a really useful tool that you use, not just stick in a drawer, um, to um, uh, help understand what the needs are that you're designing for. And, and, and off you go. Um, uh, if you're operating, trying to follow more of a kind of strict lean, lean process, um, then obviously in the, the, the premise of that is that everything is an assumption. So, you, you know, you start off making assumptions about your user but, and everything is a hypothesis. But that hypothesis should be tested mm -hmm. So you have regular iterative testing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the challenge with that is um, not to just get bogged down with... Um, 
testing has this has this bit of interaction worked yes tick um, but using those opportunities that where you have that contact with testing to um, meet your users to be gathering information about your users and building up that picture across the sprints so how do you do that how do you harness it and make sure that 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 knowledge kind of is retained and continues to grow requires some kind of knowledge management rather than um, just seeing it as very kind of discrete. Yes, we tested that thing with users. It, it worked. It didn't work um, because otherwise you're you're missing out on what that opportunity of the regular contact with your users um, brings. And I'm wittering on about it, but, but it, it's always a big discussion on my um my courses and if, if amy or ali have anything else to add no nope. um so uh yes um we're now five minutes over perhaps we should be be wrapping up um On the design box, though, how I, this is one directly for you, Amy. How do you prevent brainstorm risks such as constantly changing focus or vocal people taking over? Yeah, so I think it is very clearly setting out the intention at the start so everybody knows exactly what it is that they're focusing on. Um, maybe keep a list up of those questions. So the things that I mentioned earlier about what you want people to focus on um, and have that visible through the whole task so that you can refer back to it. Make sure that you are practicing good workshop facilitator etiquette and you are walking around the room and making sure that you're ke um, keeping people on track, just checking in that they are focusing. In terms of vocal people taking over, I think we talked to a few um, different methods for that before, but check out um, game storming which is a great book for some ideas about that. Yeah, they have something in there about um, using red and yellow cards. So if somebody's talking too much, you can present them with a yellow warning card or post-it. Um, and if they're continuing to talk too much, you can present them with a red post-it or red card. That kind of means they have to stay silent for a few minutes. Um, and you can get other people in the room to also be able to give out those cards as well. So it's not just you as the um, feeling like the bad person doing that. Um, but that can help as well. And there's lots of other ideas in that book. But I think we should probably wrap up there. OK. Um, yeah, LJ Hazard, I'm sorry we haven't got to your question. Um, it's certainly a, uh, a tricky one because it, it, you know, it sounds like the problem might be more everyone understanding the value of human centered design full stop rather than just whether they come to a workshop um, but feel free um, anyone including LJ Hazard to follow up with us with any questions outside um, of, of this um, so you can um, get in touch or send your question to Joe who I think has been in touch with all of you or to the more at bunnyfoot.com um, address um, and it can wend its way to, to one of us and we can answer it for you um, but yes, thank you very much for your questions. It's been a pleasure. Okay.